How many of you out there know about PAN? Raise your hands. Oh, good, so I can skip through the whole first part. <laughs> that works. Seriously, we've been able to help with over $4 billion in assistance funding. My role is to be able to increase access for those who have been historically marginalized and underserved. And it's truly our goal to be able to increase access for all patients who need support. And it's my job to be able to embed diversity, equity, and inclusion principles in everything that we do at PAN. And that means cultivating relationships with patient advocates such as yourselves and working with organizations such as CVS Health, CVS Specialty in particular, to be able to advance the cause. This morning, I'm proud to serve as moderator for this esteemed panel. First, let me introduce Trish Dicker, who is the Director of Sales and Health Equity Operations at CVS Health in their specialty division. And for 23 years, Trish has served in various leadership roles, ranging from HR to product development to specialty prescriber sales. And in Trisha's current role, she's responsible for working and really partnering with CVS Caremark account teams and their employer and health plan customers to help raise awareness about the importance of health equity. And so she also collaborates with them to identify innovative solutions to address health disparities. I am also pleased to present Dr. Danye Gardner, who is the current president of the Oncology Nursing Society. And that's a professional association representing over 100,000 nurses and is the professional home to more than 35,000 members. Dr. Danye presents across the globe on topics such as nursing education and development, racism in nursing, and racism in diversity. And along with the Oncology Nursing Society, he is committed to supporting and advancing oncology nurses to deliver quality and equitable care to patients with cancer. So I'd like to welcome them this morning. But before we begin with our panel discussion, let's begin by setting some context for today's discussion on health equity. A little bit of a primer, if you will. The CDC defines health equity as the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. I did say everyone. I didn't say a few of us. I didn't say some of us. I said all of us. Everyone has a fair and just opportunity. And I'd like to call out, if you look at the graphic there, that equity is not synonymous with equality. And I love the graphic because it clearly drives this point home. Equitable solutions create equal access for all. Equity considers the broad landscape of factors that shape and impact people and the way that they show up in the healthcare system. It's about their intersectionality, understanding the differences in where people are from a health perspective based on their upbringing, their identity, their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their environment, and their lived experiences. And this intersectionality impacts how patients experience healthcare, and more importantly, how they're able to navigate through it. Equity means that every individual has the same level of access and the barriers to entry are removed. And frankly, that's our work. That is what we are here to do, to help remove those barriers. So when we talk about health equity, we must consider the root causes of these health disparities, 
particularly for those who have been historically marginalized and underserved, or simply been left behind or forgotten. Racism and discrimination impacts the distribution of power, wealth, and ultimately health rooted in racist and unfair practices. And it prevents patients from seeking out and obtaining the health care that they need and deserve. Legislation and policies have been enacted that directly limit the access and affordability to health care. And again, to ensure that all get what they need. These are the structural drivers of health disparities, which dictate how access to care is received. According to the CDC, and I quote, the non-medical factors that affect a wide range of health outcomes, including the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age. These are the social drivers of health. And the way that our healthcare system has been set up and functions also causes health disparities. Accessibility of providers and receiving culturally and linguistically appropriate care, as well as the affordability of medications and health insurance, certainly drive further disparities amongst populations. So what are some of the social drivers of health? What are some of the factors? So there are a couple different categories here, socioeconomic, geographic, disease-specific, racism, and bias. Let's take socioeconomic factors, things like lack of educational opportunities, lack of earning potential, lack of health literacy, language accessibility barriers. Geographic factors can include lack of physical proximity to health care, people who are out in rural communities, lack of transportation, environmental conditions such as inferior air or water quality, or people who are unhoused. Disease-specific factors include the existence of comorbidities, or lack of access to preventive care. Racism, again, is a structural and a systemic factor. It can also be interpersonal, and it's tied to historic governmental laws, policies, and practices that sometimes result in discriminatory practice again, resulting in health disparities. And lastly, bias, implicit or unconscious bias. Those are the attitudes, the assumptions, the stereotypes, the prejudices that we carry forward into our decisions and into our actions. And again, these sometimes result in discriminatory practices that can negatively impact health outcomes. So many of you, I'm sure, are familiar, being in the healthcare profession, you're familiar with some of these stats. They're disturbing. And I'm not going to read through all of them here. But the reality is that by 2050, people of color are projected to make up more than half of the U.S. population. So we've got to get a handle on these social drivers of health. We've got to get underneath these health disparities. About one in five Americans live more than 10 miles away from a healthcare system. And transportation is a, is a huge issue. More than five million people delayed medical care due to transportation. One in six people struggle with food insecurity. These all impact health. So we see here, there was a, 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 bear, a study that was conducted by the Barrel Institute. And while only 5% of white people in the US reported that they had experienced prejudice and discrimination in their healthcare in encounters, 
If you look at the remaining stats there, 90% of people with, the, with disabilities experienced discrimination and or racism. And those numbers continue on with other populations. 20% of African Americans are more likely to get colorectal cancer and 40% are more likely to die from it. We know what the statistics show in terms of type 2 diabetes. Prevalent in the African American community and Latinx people are 17% more likely to have it. As we look at cancer rates in the American Indian and the Alaska Native population, they have higher incidences of liver, stomach, kidney, and colorectal cancers than non-white, non-Hispanic white people. Again, these are some sobering statistics. And these social drivers of health impact more than 80%, 80% of health outcomes. So let, now let's turn to our, our panel for a discussion, and hear some of their thoughts and get some of their guidance and figure out what role it is we have to play in order to eliminate these health disparities. Trish, from a pharmacy perspective, which barriers to health equity do you think are the most important to address? So I think you talked about a number of different barriers that our patients have to deal with on almost a daily basis. But I think what's perhaps the most pressing from a pharmacy perspective would be the issue of affordability. Will our patients be able to afford their medications when they walk into the pharmacy? And if they're struggling from a cost perspective, then there's no way we can reasonably expect them to be adherent to their medications. There's no way we can expect them to be working with their providers on treatment optimization plans. Um, so it is definitely a very big issue. And then from a specialty medication perspective, it's even a bigger issue when patients are paying hundreds or thousands of dollars out of cost. So luckily we do have a number of different tools that we could employ. And we have an entire team, our reimbursement counseling center at CVS, that does help those patients who are struggling with affordability really try to better navigate that system because it is so overly complicated. So we can help through connecting patients with things like copay card programs and foundation support, amazing foundations, thank you, Kim, like the Pan Foundation and others. Um, so those are very important, but what we found is that even with those great resources, it is getting harder and harder every year for patients, especially from under-resourced communities, to be able to afford their medications. And really, when you think about it, you shared a lot of really good statistics a few minutes ago. So those patients are having a higher likelihood of developing certain chronic conditions from hypertension to diabetes to certain kinds of cancer, right? So they are the ones we want to make sure are starting on their medications and then staying on their medications. So it's, it's very important. But what we're finding is it's, again, just getting more and more difficult. There are restrictions with things like copay cards from a government payer, Medicare and Medicaid perspective. That makes it more difficult. Obviously, foundation funds are not infinite. We wish that they were, but they're not. So it's just getting more and more difficult. So one of the things that, that we do, and as Kim mentioned, I work closely with our, uh, with our payers. So whether that be health plans or the, um, employer groups, we work really closely and they want to know, you know, what, what can we do from an affordability perspective? So one of the things that we talk about is plan design. You know, what can you do to structure a plan design that's more conducive to your patients from historically marginalized communities being able to better afford their medications. And we can't 
mandate what kind of plan structure they should have. That's that's up to the plan. It's not up to us. We'd like it if we could tell them. But we are able to provide recommendations, solutions, and to try to lead by example. So for instance, I was in our Hartford, Connecticut office a few months ago, and I was able to meet with our HR team. And our plan year is a little bit different. We start 6-1. So we were able to roll out a new plan design for our own CVS health colleagues that make less than $60,000 a year. And that is a much more robust plan design. They have lower out-of-pocket costs. They have lower co-pays. And the whole reason for us doing this is we don't want them to delay getting diagnosed. We don't want them to delay getting treated until it's too late and they become life-threatening uh, conditions. So we you know, offer those lower co-pays and those lower out-of-pocket costs so they have an easier time getting their medications at the pharmacy, having their visits with their physicians. So we, I think it's really, you know, the onus is on all of us to see what we can do to try and help from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think you're, you're exactly right. It does, it, it, it takes the entire ecosystem to be involved and having knowledge of the resources that are out there to be able to assist with the affordability issue. Dr. Danye, what do you see as the biggest challenge from your perspective? Um, well, for a provider perspective, I am an oncology nurse, have been an oncology nurse for almost 20 years, and we may have some fellow oncology nurses or clinicians in the room. Um, you know, we have over 4 million registered nurses in the United States today. I was in nursing school a little over 20 years ago, and the under pinning of really uh, addressing the barrier that we have of making sure that we eliminate or really encourage health equity is making sure we have cultural competence. Cultural competence requires you to be educated on cultural competence. You may look at me and say, he's a black man. He is culturally competent. I am not. <laughs> I do not represent all black people, right? I do not represent all men. There are assumptions that, that go along uh, with that. Um, and unfortunately, to recent years, there has not been a lot of education on cultural competence or health equity in nursing curricula. There are a there is a lot or a multitude of content that a nurse must uh, learn in order to sit for the state licensure exam that encompasses a generalized approach to providing care from anyone to uh, mothers who are um, undergoing childbirth to people undergoing psychiatric conditions to patients with cancer. So a nurse, a registered nurse is trained to be a generalist. I remember in my undergraduate cur curriculum that the only piece for my four years of my bachelor's degree that I remember, and it's what we remember that we utilize in practice. If we don't remember, are we really utilizing it? It was a health assessment class, and at the end of the health assessment class, after we learned how to assess every system, and the sequelae of events that goes with symptomologies in terms of what the patient was complaining about, you would think there would be some notions or some mentions of any particular SDOH or cultural underpinnings as we reviewed each of those symptoms, but no. At the end, we had a potluck and, and talked about different cultures, but the cultures was not attached to the health conditions of the patient. So is that really cultural competence or it says we have a potluck to say we, that we are trying to be culturally competent? So in order to be culturally competent to address health equity, you have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. So thank you all for showing up today because it does create some uncomfortabilities because it's through uncomfortabilities that we grow, we change, and we become more equitable. Um, so we know that that gap exists in undergraduate curricula as all the competing information that they're trying to learn to be a registered nurse, not a subspecialty such as oncology nursing, because that's a whole nother um, section for another day. Um, so what does the Oncology Nursing Society do to fill that gap that we know is a gap? We know in recent years, in the last decade, there have been great strides. Unfortunately, due to societal issues that we have faced throughout the country, that has really sparked uh, changing some of the curricula uh, to include these um, these these issues um, to integrate that in the curriculum. So the Oncology Nursing Society understands that. So we do provide education content and resources for our registered nurse uh, clinician members to fill that gap. And that's why I'm here today, right, to represent the Oncology Nursing Society and saying that we need to practice, the clinicians need to look like the patients look. 
when I first um, went to my, um, I live in Houston, Texas. I'm from a smaller town. Um, and in the smaller town, I saw a lot of patients who actually looked like me on the surgical unit. They were African-American patients who were in for diabetes management or uncontrolled diabetes, and uncontrolled hypertension, those things that Kim mentioned earlier about the health inequities that we oftentimes face. And these oftentimes pacified rather than treated and then um, patients are not able to provide adequate self-care because we're not grappling with those cultural competence underpinnings that they need to actually care for the medical conditions. Then I moved to the fourth largest city in the United States, and I didn't see any patients that looked like me. Well, that doesn't sound right. You're the most one diverse cities in the United States, yet the patients do not look like you. Access to care. Doesn't, doesn't really matter where you live all of a sudden. People in a small town received more care. How was that care? Mm, you can judge that. But the cutting edge care, the care that is in research, the care that is changing lives and saving lives, the people who needed to be there were not there. That's an access issue. That's an health equity issue. So we have uh, strides to make. We're working in an intergener intergenerational workforce where you have clinicians like myself and older who, who did not learn a lot about health equity in the nursing curricular that we're trying to subsidize as well. Um, and then making sure that we have advocates in the healthcare arena to be able to impart and, and bridge that gap um, with nurses um, in caring for patients with many different issues, not just cancer. Thank you for that, Danye. Wow, that, that, there's a lot there. I mean, starting from cultural sensitivity, cultural competency, recognizing that people and communities are not monolithic, to understanding that it has to be part of a curricula and getting in as, as quickly as you can, you know, as soon as you can. And um, then creating a, a safe and a brave space to have uncomfortable conversations all critically important things because you want to be able to grow your own understanding and really be able to recognize and deal with our own bias. We all have them. And so in order to build our own cultural competency is, is what you've, you've talked about so eloquently. So thank you for that. Um, what are some of the things that we should avoid as, as partner, as providers, as, as pharmacists? And, and others when it comes to addressing health equity. We talk about the things that we should do. What are the things that we need to not do? I think I have a good one for this. Uh, we should avoid thinking that health equity is kind of a one size fits all approach because that's not at all the case. What could work beautifully in Miami might not work so well in New York, might not work at all in LA. And there's not a, a precise health equity playbook that tells us how to, you know, address every health equity issue, close all of those gaps and increase access. We can't undo hundreds of years of inequities overnight. It's just not realistic to think that, you know, that we would be able to do that. So what we found works particularly well as we entered the, the health equity space is to really look at the data. So focus on the data. I, and as I said, I work with our employers, I work with our health plans. So we sit down, we look at the data, we see what their member population looks like. We see where the biggest disparities are. Where do we need to try and close the gaps first? Is it in particular parts of the country? Do they struggle the most in LA, for instance? What do they struggle with? Are they struggling from a hypertension perspective, from a diabetes perspective and being adherent on those medications? So we really need to look at that. We need to look and see what kind of social drivers that the members are struggling with the most. And then, and only then, once we really try to take more of a, of a customized approach, then can we sit down and say, okay, which ones of our internal resources could we potentially leverage? And then what type of our programs, our services, will we be able to roll out that would work particularly well with this disparity that we're trying to address? 
And how can we effectively partner with community-based organizations out there, with faith-based organizations out there, with, you know, local government, federal government, all sorts of different healthcare institutions, because it takes a village and we can't, we can't do it alone. One organization can't do it. So we all need to work together. So I think when we do that and we realize it's not a cookie cutter approach to health equity and we really try and come up with tailored, innovative solutions, then we can start to make a difference and we can start to chip away at those inequities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have uh, a couple of things that you sh think should be avoided? Sure. I, when you asked that question, Kim, the first thing that popped in my mind, if anyone remembers when Oprah gave out all the cars, you get a car, 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 and everyone wished that we were in that audience to get one of those cars, right? Well, all the think about that. I'm giving you a car and I'm am I fixing your problem? Can you put gas in that car? Can you provide insurance covered from the car? Do you have a driver's license? Or better yet, can you even drive a car? So let's elaborate on what she just spoke about is that we it's not a one size fits all approach. And we can't stereotype what health equity means for every for everyone. Um, just a personal story. Um, it's my own public health information. I was diagnosed with an ear infection two weeks ago out of the blue. I've never had an ear infection in life, even as a child. I'm like, what is going on? The doctor says, you're getting old. Okay, we're all getting old if we, if we live long <laughs> enough, right? Um, so I went in and it was not my doctor. It was another doctor in the office because when you have an add-on appointment, you oftentimes don't get your provider. And I'm talking to her. I'm giving my symptoms. I didn't tell her I'm a nurse. Usually as any one of clinicians in the room, we don't let people know our secret sauce, right? Unless they ask or they break the rules or don't do what they're supposed to do. And then the clinician shows up. But she was following principle and then she starts asking me questions or, and I remember specifically she said, do you ha are you experiencing any, any vertigo? Well, I know what vertigo is because I'm a health clinician, but how did she, she made the assumption that I knew what vertigo was. Vertigo is not dizziness. Right. So I, intentionally, because I, you know, every every day you learn things. Life is a lesson. Things throughout the day teach us things. So I said, no, I'm not dizzy. I haven't experienced any dizziness. Well, we know anything about vertigo. Vertigo is doesn't it's not synonymous to dizziness. Vertigo is when changing of your position and you become dizzy. But did she stop and clarify my response? Or did she make the assumption that he's using some of this medical jargon that even though he didn't give me the information that I needed, he probably understands. So it's in those assumptions and it's in those stereotypes that a one size fits all approach doesn't mean that everyone's going to get a car and be able to utilize that car. And that's why even though Trish so eloquently spoke about what she spoke, this is the same arena from a pharmacy perspective or oncology nursing perspective, it is a human perspective that we must address individually and roll up to the system to fix the system issues as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So sort of moving with the notion of assumptions, how do you integrate patient voices in the work that you do? Because it's so critical, that ability to listen and to learn and, and to expand sort of our ideas around who people are and, and, and how they show up. So what does CVS do specifically in that space? Yeah. So we're always looking to do some innovative pilots uh, around helping to address disparities for our patients. And last year, we knew we wanted to focus on the social drivers at the point of care and seeing if our trusted CVS uh, patient-facing teams could work with those social drivers with patients and be able to connect them to community-based organizations and the resources that they had. So when we started thinking about this, we immediately thought about, okay, well, where do we start? What space do we start in? And we thought about our PAH, our uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension space. And the biggest reason behind this is because our PAH nurses are an amazing group and they have such strong trusted, open conversations with their patients that they're dealing with on a regular basis. And we you know, wanted to leverage what we were hearing, the voices of those PAH, PAH patients when we were designing the pilot. And some of the things we were hearing were really, really disconcerting. Things like, well, you know, I haven't been able to be as adherent as I would like to on my medication because I, you know, I had to choose between 
paying my rent this month or taking my meds or putting healthy food on the table for my family or taking my meds. And it seems selfish for me to just worry about myself. So light bulb went off and we said, okay, let's listen to what our patients are telling us and let's do something in that PAH space. So that's where we decided to start. And we rolled out a pilot at the very end of last year, last December, and we didn't want to overwhelm ourselves. So we decided to pick five different locations to start the pilot. And again, we just started in the PAH space. And the way that it works is the PAH nurses are in there, in the patient's home, meeting with them on a regular basis, and they're listening. And they're always listening for um, some kind of a social driver to kind of organically come up in conversation. Or maybe they notice something when they're looking around their house and they need to be re really kind of in tune with their patients, which luckily they are. Um, and then... What they do is when they do notice something, they can start doing a social, uh, an SDOH assessment with their patients. So, and they have this good, robust platform that they can work with. So if they're asking their patients about, you know, are you struggling to put healthy food on the table for your family? Did you struggle with transportation to get to appointments or employment this month? Um, tell us how you're doing from a stress management perspective. And when they notice something, they go into this robust platform. They can, in that platform, send referrals out to the different community-based organizations out there to try to get them support that they need. And the great thing is that it's a closed loop system. So they'll see when those referrals come back, they can see if we're able to get their patients connected with different resources at those CBOs. And so far, even though we have you know, only been doing this for less than a year, so far it's going really well. And we wound up expanding already. So we already expanded to Miami, Florida with our Care Plus specialty pharmacy. So that not only includes PAH, but the other specialty therapies that that pharmacy is managing. We also are giving this a shot with our quorum home infusion nurses in Texas. And then also I mentioned our reimbursement counseling center in the beginning of this conversation. So they're doing that as well because they work so closely with those patients. Some of their patients don't even have access to internet or might be overwhelmed filling out forms for support. So they're helping and they're asking those uh, SDOH uh, needs questions and linking them to resources as well. And then little teaser here, we haven't done this yet, but a little teaser, we're also working to launch something, knock on wood this year, with providers offices in California, where the provider or their staff, if they notice some kind of SDOH need, they'll be able to go online, fill out a form and start the referral process right in the office. So, um, and I'll tell really quickly before, uh, before I get the hook, really quickly, um, a, a great example. And we have lots of these little examples, but this one I thought was really compelling about a patient who was really struggling. This happened a few months ago, really struggling. We had to send out seven different referrals to different organizations, seven. And within a matter of, it was either two or three days, we were able to get her connected with some um, money to be able to pay her rent that month. They were gonna turn off her lights, literally turn off her lights. So we were able to get her some support to help pay her utility bill connected her to a food pantry and also um, some assistance with medical expenses. So we know that the funds are not unlimited. We know we won't be able to connect everyone with support, but you know, we're trying to do what we can and do some more pilots to incorporate the voices of, of the customers, of our patients. Wow, this is, I mean, this is just really, really good stuff. You know, when I think about CVS Health or I think about CVS, I think about the pharmacy, you know, but you all are doing so much more. And what's really impressive is that you're willing to take the risks and actually get into the community. And these stories that you're sharing, I mean, this is this is where, this is what has to happen. And you all are real innovators in the space of starting these pilot programs. So, you know, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing the story.